Hello. Is it on? Can I just speak normally? Do I just speak normally or do I need to like hold it? Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bruce Pittman, and I'm the president of the third year class of medical students here at UAB. I'm originally from Greensboro, North Carolina, and I'm currently a student on the Huntsville Regional Medical Campus. I'm here today to introduce Dr. Selwyn Vickers, the James C. Lee Jr. Endowed Chair, Senior Vice President of Medicine, and Dean of the UAB School of Medicine for his fifth State of the School of Medicine address. I'm very much looking forward to what he has to share with us today. Looking back on times I've spent with Dr. Vickers, I'm reminded of how much he genuinely values and enjoys spending time with medical students. For example, he makes a point to have lunch with student leaders on a regular basis to garner feedback from the boots on the ground, to generate positive discussion on future initiatives, such as the recently commissioned lecture series on academic medicine, and even to toss around a couple quiz questions about MEN syndromes, you know, just to make sure we're all staying on top of our toes. After one such lunch I attended, I remember saying to myself, wow, the dean of the entire school, this massive entity, just sat down and had lunch with me and some of my classmates. That's pretty cool. Dr. Vickers' commitment to building relationships is something that I'm sure many of you have personally experienced as well. I think it provides him with a unique perspective, allowing for informed leadership in his captaining this incredible ship that is our school. I think this perspective among many other things, some of which he's about to share with us today, are leading us into very bright horizons. And now, if you'll please join me in welcoming Dr. Selwyn Vickers. Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate that introduction, and uh, it's one where I didn't hear again that I was from Demopolis, Alabama, but that's cool. So um, thank you all for coming, and I want to thank Kathy and Paul and all of our team for working together uh, for lunch, um, choosing something that everybody enjoys. It's not easy, but I think everybody's a fan of Chick-fil-A, so thank you all for being here. As Bruce said, this is the fifth year and so this talk will be a little different and it is entitled it's a bit of a five-year look back um, I would say that um, this is a talk where although not everybody's pictures on the screen you all participated in this journey so from the beginning I'll tell you I won't catch everybody's photo on the screen but from the beginning I want you to know that you were a part of what we will share and which may not be repeated again, but you were a huge part of it. I think this talk is only, I think, challenged and saddened by a really difficult year in our community. Um, there were a number of people who we lost this year, some through um, really difficult tragedies um, that really affected our world, others through long, well-lived lives and who contributed, and others through accidents. Um, but needless to say, these were all valuable members of our community, and they will be missed. And we've celebrated lives and cried and uh, shared some of the joys we've had with these individuals. Um, and it really is worth taking a moment of silence to recognize these, um, these eight people who I would like to say were a big part of our community, if you join me in doing so. Specifically, we also lost a couple of key partners. Tom Smith, in the short time period I'd had here, had here um, really loved his relationship with UAB. Um, and his untimely death will uh, haunt us for some time because he was such a tremendous leader in the VA system and a truly great partner. Um, Dr. Agarwal, uh, I think, treasured him as much as anybody as a senior leader in the school and a committed faculty member and leader at the VA recognized with me as much as anybody the value that Tom Smith brought to our relationship. A new friend we had, Dr. Bagona Miose, was the first African dean of the University of Cape Town 
the school that has more NIH funding outside of any other institution in the world, uh, outside of the United States more than any other institution in the world. His tragic and untimely death, and I had the pleasure of going to his uh, South African state funeral, which recognizes country leaders. Um, he will be missed, not only from the great perspective that he had about UAB and the relationship we'd had with Cape Town, but also in his country, uh, where he was an unbelievably uh, rising star of what he meant both to the African continent, but also to the world of science uh, and leadership. So these individuals especially also meant and something great to our institution. I begin these talks uh, by seeing and showing some pictures, but I, I do not want a, you to take this for granted. The success that we've had, that the institution has had, has been in no small part due to President Watt's leadership. Um, and he obviously was in this role before myself, but in his role as president, there are just a number of accolades that can go to his leadership and particularly to his team. Um, these individuals, including our provost, Pam Benoit, our vice president for research, Chris Brown, um, Tom Brannon in particular, uh, working with us and helping recruit Sarah Andrews and Buckley, who has really helped transform the level of communications at the university. Alan Bolton, who really knows our world because he was in a role of leadership in the school before. Our relationships with Kathy Nugent and Alicia Jones, who helps us. Uh, Will's a part of that team. Kurt Carver also, who is really doing a transformative job for IT. And then Paulette um, Dilworth, who is working with us through diversity. Johnny Jones, you all don't know so much, but he obviously is the trigger behind a lot of the growth that's going on in our undergrad. Uh, that has grown really more than any other school in our state by percentage of adding new people to the attraction that was what we call UAB. And then uh, my partnership with Will Fernani. Uh, obviously, um, the success we've had uh, and the growth that we had, he owns as much as I do. Um, that's both on the clinical side as well as on our side for our full scope of our academic mission in research and education. Couldn't choose a better CEO for our system and partner around these credible goals of being top 10 in quality, top 10% in patient satisfaction, and our goal of getting well inside of the top 20 for NIH funding and being a place for where the best talent can come and be retained. The other person who really has had a transformative role in his new job, you'll see him listed in other positions, is Tony Jones. Tony, former chair of anesthesia, took on a job that was a bit undefined, I won't say was ill-defined, but it was well placed and I think in many ways he's exceeded our expectations of what you could do in this role as president of our practice plan, senior associate dean of clinical affairs and chief physician executive for the health system. Tony is one of the hardest working men here at UAB and is always trying to drive a role for our entire enterprise to grow and move forward and be a transformative force within Alabama and the deep south. So this five year journey. Um, I said briefly that as you'll see it and walk through it with me, it's one that may not be repeated and that's, that's okay. I would love for it to, but that's a likelihood that may not occur because of the way things align. Secondly, it involved a number of people who you sit in the audience and a number of things that, that found themselves uh, aligned and driven in order for us to actually move this forward. So I'll walk you through as this is sort of played through my mind in tapes. There are some old slides, but thanks to our communications team, Tyler and Britt and Paige, who have helped take my old slides and make them a little bit better so that I don't have to show you the slides I showed five years ago. Um, but some of the themes will be there and it will really hopefully set the backdrop of the changes that we think have been unique for the institution as we go forward in the School of Medicine. So this vision that we put forward, it's a slightly different but really captures what we talk about being the preferred academic medical center. Uh, it really is an investment in talent and resources um, to really bring about the highest levels of clinical care, scholarship and innovation, which includes discovery and training the best people in the world to create an environment for great healthcare, science and discovery for Alabama and the Deep South and our country. Um, those are the things that I think drove what we did. and. Getting there, the how is often more important than anything else that you put out of what you want to do. Um, it certainly wouldn't have occurred if we couldn't get buy-in broadly. And one of the things I was terribly appreciative of, that as we began this journey five years ago, not only did I have 
the attention and support of both the CEO of our health system, our president, our board leaders, our trustee board members engaged in this process, our HSF board members to the day still engaged in this process, who make up these individuals, make up our health system board, engaged and became uh, a really, I would say, not solely in the details, but enough to actually drive the transformation. So it's not common, but it's a really appreciative when your board actually vests in where you want to go and becomes a leverage to get there. So this book I did show five years ago, and this book is basically a treatise on individuals who want to move up the ladder of success and use the talent and skill sets that got them in their first job, but it speaks to the transformation that individuals need to make if they're going to move to higher roles. Uh, I use that as a sort of a metaphor of what we needed to do, and what you will see in this discussion is a bit of an outline of the things that I thought were fundamentally important for us to both create uh, a plan around the vision, uh, gather the data that actually would allow the vision to go forward, and address the issues that were fundamental to our future success. So these are not in random order. They are actually in order which I think is important for change management. And in this case, people will always tell you the last thing you want to attack is culture. But for us, I think we needed to address some cultural issues. In the first part, I'll walk through that. I'll talk about the financial investment piece, challenges, and then end up with success for each of these. And I'll go through in the following order programs, people, infrastructure, and organizational structure. So what was one of the first challenges we faced in the culture? And the culture was the dean's office was important, but I had some concerns that in the scope of what its capacity was, it might be limited. So when you look at these individuals who, when I came, were in the dean's office, minus Dr. Agarwal for the senior leadership group, this number was a very hardworking, committed group of individuals, a group that was previously led by Bob Rich and Ray. But it's one that I asked for some external data of what that group might look like. And it wasn't necessarily a desire to just accumulate a number of people around me, but it was a belief that if we were going to actually make a difference, there had to be enough leaders at the table to drive it. Leadership. I've said, as others have told me, is pretty much like oxygen and respect. You only miss it when they're absent. Um, and you only think about it when someone takes them away. And, and so in this scenario, this was the team. Don had come on, Bob had been there, Pam was there, um, David and um, Hughes were all a part of a hardworking team. What the AAMC said externally, you guys have a really high functioning group, but you are actually 18 to 20 FTE smaller than any other school your size in the country. And in fact, in the senior leadership team, most of these people aren't full FTEs. They're only a half FTE. So I said, that's interesting. That's an interesting thing. If we want to grow, what must this look like in the future if we're going to have a chance to do it? Secondly, fundamentally, we always asked the question when we were going to grow, either or. Can we grow in research or grow in clinical care? And, and what I felt was a challenge is that I don't think the question is either or, it has to be and. This paper nicely put forward by Margaret Bowman in 2007 from Pittsburgh and Penn highlighted the synergistic relationship between the academic mission and the clinical enterprise. And they were basically saying they were mutually inclusive of one another's success. To that end, the top 20 US News World and, Ro World and Report hospitals are also the top 20 NIH funded institutions. So this idea that you were going to be great in one and not the other was a misnomer. And the idea that you're going to be a great AMC by being great in one and minor in another, it would not happen. We had to find a way to grow in both and believe that they were both valuable. This is demonstrated by the fact that when I was in Minnesota, we were a bit of an example of the direction you didn't want to go in. And this was driven by a number of things, not so much one person, uh, individuals. But this trend down was what we faced and saw in 2013. Ray had began to institute some programs and laid the foundation after Bob and Anupam was carrying them out. But this is our status of where we started. And they clearly had laid groundwork for us to change this. But this was a model when we were there, when I was in Minnesota, when we looked to try to grow, how would we grow like others? And what would we would do to avoid the mistakes to be in this trajectory? At the same side, when you look at where we were in our research ranking, we were also at a pretty significant nadir in our clinical program ranking for the US News and World Report. They correlated pretty tightly, and I think you'll see that that will continue. The other piece, after addressing those two, two cultural issues, was 
maybe even a heavier lift is around a financial investment. That in this idea of wanting to grow research, one of the studies that the WMC did, looking at sort of the top 40 medical schools, they came away that almost every dollar you got externally from the NIH actually cost you money. So for every NIH dollar, you've got to find 53 cents to support it. So you'll see that theme as a real challenge for us, but it also brought the bear that we had to understand that research would cost and create growth around us, but it would take an investment. It wouldn't just happen, and even when we got it, you couldn't keep it without having a sustainable model. The other thing that the team did early on was to also put data around how we were supporting this investment. We, in fact, were the only school in the top 50 without a dean's tax. That may have been something to be proud of 25 years ago, but not in the current era. Secondly, we didn't have a designated plan other than just our departments alone of how our clinical revenue would really support the broader mission of both research and education. And we had, at that time, only one department inside of the top 10 for NIH ranking. So we asked the question, could this be a viable model based on our clinical footprint? Well, in reality, our health system was as big or bigger than Emory's, Vanderbilt's, or North Carolina's. We had a clinical revenue stream. We were as big as they were. If we were the size of a very small AMC, maybe this is not a credible aspiration. But we were in no way smaller than these places, yet their contributions were significantly greater than what we were doing at that time. And I won't go into the detail, but it was transparent for us to understand what was being put into those places and the opportunity we had. What about programs? What was our challenge in the programs? Well, we knew at the time we had a number of things we had to get done. Our CCTS, with Bob leading, was in a no-cost extension, and we knew we had to get that renewed, and it had some fundamental pieces that had to be put in place. But that's our baseline for doing clinical research. Without it, we were not in the game. Our cancer center was coming up for Newell. And I highlighted the fact that as we were moving toward our reaccreditation of our medical school, this was like the Joint Commission for Education. If we don't get that accreditation, thanks to Bob's leadership, Craig Hosley, and a number of individuals who worked on that, we can't talk about these other things. These are fundamentals for us to be who we want to be. So having a laser focus on making sure we didn't go backwards and that we got approval was fundamental, but that was on our plate, as well as a number of programs and institutes that we knew had to happen. We had a new department on our table to establish, as well as a new regional medical campus had to be started. In addition, what I heard early on is that you can't recruit the Birmingham. Problematic. Every time you see anything of Birmingham, it's a black and white 1963 picture. And these were all the people at some level in this period of the five-year stint that we had to replace and had to address getting to Birmingham, along with keeping the people we wanted here. And so there were things that had to be put in place to change the dynamics of this recruitment process, as well as making sure we could keep our best leaders on the table and now launch these new institutes with leaders as well. And finally, the challenge we had from our current organization is that we had an either-or mentality. Our practice plan, our school, and our health system were like three ships going in the same direction, but somehow never really aligned. And often confrontational around a number of things, often passing the hat for any new thing we wanted to do, distinctions unnecessarily built because of those identities, and challenges to be efficient in what we wanted to be. So they were all arrows going in a direction, often with their own separate agenda and world, and it was something you felt palpable when you came to UAB as a part of our history. It was positive in many lights, but it was one that we questioned could we sustain in that manner if we wanted to be what we wanted to accomplish in the future. So with those challenges we face, what were some of the things that we were able and you participated in making happen? And this is the part that wouldn't occur without the investments, the hard work of many people, and may not repeat itself because of the uniqueness of the time. So this is the senior leadership team of the dean's office, including a number of people uh, who have been added. There are a number of associate deans that are in the School of Medicine down in the education, Victor Darla Uzma, who works closely around research. But this group of individuals, from my point of view, I wanted people who were respected in the school with great talent for leadership who could provide the value of serving our community. Anupam Magawal, when I first met him, would be a person who I said I knew I wanted to work with when he was the interim dean. 
And he serves as really a deputy in overseeing a number of things, whether it's retention or programs. He's a nationally recognized nephrologist, and most of all, he is an appreciated and valued leader in this school. Dr. Bhavindavanisti Tika, as you know, was the chair, longstanding chair of CDIB, and takes the simplest of ideas that I have and the most complex challenges and executes on them. As you'll see as it relates to our programs for research growth, our space activity, she, with a unique set of skill and deliverable, makes those things happen for our institution. Don and Lakeisha add an unbelievable level of financial acumen and strategic guidance and planning that any dean would be treasured to have them. They provide that leadership across the health system in the school to drive our enterprise and to keep us financially credible and accountable. Bob Kimberly, you've seen, is the role of research dean focused largely on our clin clinical translational world. And the CCTS is a model for the country. It's one that's helped transforming our Deep South. It's been renewed, you'll hear me talk about, but it creates a platform to better health and translational science throughout the Deep South. Tony Jones, you heard me speak about in his role, and he will be a transformative figure for our clinical enterprise within the school and our health system. The first person I had to appoint to move us toward the LCME world was a dean for diversity. And I clearly didn't want someone who was a token in a position of color, I wanted someone who was credible, who had a career in the field of diversity, and who could be respected for their science. And we couldn't think of a better person than Mona Fuad, who's our newest member of the National Academy, but also has been a transformative figure of putting diversity on our table for being excellent and being inclusive. David Rogers will tell you that he was that trailing spouse who fell into a position, who's done a credible job, incredible job, of being our senior associate dean for faculty affairs. He told me, he says, you know, I really wasn't designed for this job, but David has done a great job as being an advisor on a number of things, but now taking on the role of chief wellness officer. Craig Hosley almost slipped away to Texas, but fortunately, Craig being elevated at Hughes left uh, has done a great job in our educational program, really taking all of the things that both Ray gave me to do and I knew needed to be done to make that school a transformative footprint he and Tony Leith, who works with him, are doing a phenomenal job in the School of Medicine. The people on the bottom row are not any less important. You've heard me talk about Tony, who's overseen our recruitment process globally in the school, who sees, oversees the educational program, and recruitment's been a big part of what we've done, so she's had a lift, as well as our strategic planning. Sarah Andrews is new. She's our new vice president in the School for uh, Development. We're excited about her being here. And Jean Ann Larson has been great for as our leadership officer for the school and the health system, and for so many of our departments has meant a valuable resource. Finally, you've heard me talk about Paige and what she's done, this talk and our communication strategy, and what I'll say about Nisha, she's the glue that keeps all of this together. The other individuals who made this happen are the chairs, and they are in many ways our board of directors who drive the enterprise who are really the core academic leaders across the full scope of what we do, and I couldn't thank them enough and couldn't be prouder of who they are and what they mean to our institution. So this is what those changes were from the challenges we faced. And so addressing the issue related to the cultural piece, we knew we needed to grow. Programs were put out, resources put in place, and we've had a remarkable growth, really unparalleled by almost any school in the country. So 100 million net new dollars in five years, we won't repeat that again. Very few will. Many of this, much of this occurring when the NIH budget is flat. So great trajectory, great effort. Most of the time when you've asked to go get a grant, it seems not to make a difference. Well, for those of you who got grants, it made a huge difference. In addition, that number, so even when you get a grant and you increase the number, you have to outgrow your competitors and your peers. And outgrowing those, you did all too well. You went from 31 to 21. No school in the country has grown by that number of slots. So that's quite remarkable. Can't tell you it will continue. We haven't reached our goal yet, but what you've done has been transformative. In addition, you're well inside of the top 10, if you would, for public schools and you're the youngest of these public schools in the country. You're only 49 years old. The most of these are all over 100 years. And you've done this in a period of time when you're only 49. San Diego's a little over 50, but the rest are well over 100. In addition, I call this the Elite Eight as we're moving toward basketball season. 
Um, and there are eight schools in the country who've added 100 million to their portfolio. Only one that's had a greater increase, and that's Northwestern. And Northwestern is in a unique place, a unique payer mix, a lot of money. Uh, in spite of that, we've outgrown almost all the other places, and this Elite Eight is a pretty unique company to be in with the only public institutions in there, Pittsburgh and UC San Francisco. So UAB in a very unique space in this company of growth. In addition, when we started, I mentioned we had one department inside of the top 10, and now we have six. And in fact, we have one that's ranked number one. And in fact, all the departments, there are 24 listed, 22 out of 24 have all grown, right? So not everybody has grown at the same rate, but everybody has had some growth in this space of increasing their NIH dollars and taking the challenge to execute on that. And where the school grows is where the departments make that happen. Medicine has grown probably about not the greatest number, but by the greatest amount. As medicine grows from 59 to 86 million, that's quite powerful for us. And dermatology is number one. And so that's huge. Surgery has also grown. Pediatrics have grown. And I don't want to leave out anybody, so I'm not going to call every department. Bioengineering is brand new. And in its order of events, they were been in the top 10 since the first or second year they were established. So a number of great leaders, a number of accomplishments by individuals in the department and the chairs driving this change. And as we said, culturally, that correlation between US News world and ranked programs for your clinical excellence nicely fits with your NIH rank. So 21st and 10, 10 new programs now in US News World Report that are ranked. That's more than everybody in the Deep South, more than Vanderbilt and Emory, North Carolina, except Duke, and now ranked number 21 in NIH funding. Very tight correlate. Great innovation and discovery in science is at the core of driving great patient care. And so we want to continue that cultural understanding. This is also a nice slide up of where the clinical growth has gone. Tony's been at the heart of this with Sherry and other chairs of improving our access. All of our chairs at the clinical part of this, of driving these changes, have been fundamental in this process of growth and have made this a reality of not only growing the research, but growing our clinical enterprise in order to drive this engine. The financial investment is where everybody stepped up. Our practice plan, our hospital, our health system through Viva, all stepped up to give dollars in a central location to allow us to recruit chairs, retain faculty, and invest in programs. Our goal is 55 million. We think that's a reasonable goal when you look at the size of our cl clinical footprint and revenue, and we think it's a goal that can get us well inside of that top 20. This is the chart of where those dollars have been and where they've started and allowed us to grow to. And these are the packages that have been put on the table, where we've both supported centers, supported recruitment of individuals to invest in our faculty and our infrastructure. And this other financial investment, our community is also catching light of the fact that UAB's desire to be a nationally recognized AMC, and this contribution of the O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center gift has been a great one that Mike Beer and the rest of our institution are extremely proud of. Our campaign finally reached this goal. That goal was crossed over with the gift from the Cancer Center. I must tell you, as exciting as the one billion is, Donors often make these dollars, almost 95 to 97% are already targeted. Less than 2 to 3% of these dollars are discretionary for us to do what we want. The vast majority, and we appreciative of, appreciate them, are all driven in the aspect of making sure that the donor has it to go where they'd like to be. So people have said, why can't you take 300 million out and build a building or another 250 and build this? Well, unfortunately, we don't have control over them. They are already dedicated to specific areas of where our donors have targeted. Our board of visitors, we established here are a number of individuals who have bought in the UAB, many who are not in Alabama, particularly those, Ted Love, who is in San Francisco, Gail Castle in Indiana, they're our leaders. I can't thank them enough for coming twice a year to hear about the school and invest. My, my charge to them is that I want them to invest their time and talent. I realize if they're committed to both their time and talent, their treasure will follow. And that has been the case to over $46 million contributed by this Board of Visitors. And then what about in our programs? I mentioned to you that education couldn't be forgotten about. And a number of our program directors, 
Uh, I remember meeting Lisa Willett in the airport, flying out to USC to get her master's in education. A number of our program directors have sought to really make education a focused discipline of their career. And I couldn't be more excited to know that people are finding this a space to get training and to make this discipline something that's important at UAB. But getting our accreditation was fundamental. So past site visit, we had eight citations. This time, we only had two citations. Great work from Bob Rich and Craig and the team who drove this. They've created the learning communities. We've started the Montgomery campus, where they have their full cohort of students who are matching all over the country. One of the things that we fundamentally had not achieved in, in our period as a school, we've continually been deemed on the fact that we were not diverse in comparison to the representation in our state. Our state's about 24, 25% um, underrepresented minorities. Um, we've been around eight or 9%. And I, I'm appreciative of the team working extremely hard to help change these numbers. These numbers have gone now on average to 16% and hopefully will stay there and get there and hopefully move us beyond the issue of an area where we had not reached that mark. And I think that's an important step in light of the fact that number one, we can't often get all of those students in state and our in, out of state tuition is almost three times our in state tuition. As related to the other programs, our CCTS did get renewed. It got renewed the first time. It's just been reviewed again and Bob has shared broadly that it has been uh, scored at a level that puts it one of the top three in the country. Uh, the platform of what it is laid for impacting not only Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana through relationships built on trust, credible value, and delivery is one that the rest of the country should model and I think would, likes to, so would like to model. So that, again, has been a tremendous success in the leadership by Bob and the team. The Cancer Center has been renewed. Ed Partridge, two terms as the leader there in that period and two renewal cycles. We're excited about the work that Mike Beer will do, and that was also something that had to be done. We also did develop a set of core scientific initiatives that we could rally around. Things that didn't sort of come out of my mind, but the community said these were valuable. Precision medicine, informatics, investing in our basic science programs in a significant way, inflammation, infection and in immunity, the I3, and then population health disparities. These are the things that you all said were important. They, by their value, were things that were not necessarily disease specific, but they were things that we would commit to, be, to do well, and these were things that the NIH were going to fund. We also developed a number of new institutes and centers. We started a global health program and had Gates Grand Challenge Awards. We had the collaboration funded by our Board of Visitors with the University of Cape Town that has a number of grants submitted. And then uh, under our leadership of the Dean's Office, particularly with TICA, we started these multi-PR, second R01 and Blue Sky Awards, these initiatives to drive the funding within our own community, extra bridge funding to also make sure individuals were having research retreats, as well as most recently looking at our cores. And then the centers and institutes you will hear about, but particularly around those ones I mentioned, PMI, our Cancer Survivorship, Center for Genomics, as well as Informatics. Our Pittman scholars came out of this as well, and we funded 25 now. These are individuals where we commit to create a pipeline for our investigation. What was also obvious, that we were highly competitive and successful, but most of the individuals who were driving that success had a few gray hairs. And so we needed to have a youthful group coming through. And this is our 20, this is, these are maybe our fifth cohort of those scholars with this group making 25. Our best talent, usually almost always funded, and going on to future funding success. So we're excited about these individuals in our next group. In order to grow, we needed to be able to get people to UAB. And the growth that we've had had to first retain our best and brightest. You can't grow just by bringing in new people and not valuing the people here. And we made a concerted effort to be sensitive to people who felt they wanted to stay here and needed some support and some demonstration that they were valued to be here. And we've tried to make a significant effort to do that, totaling nearly 102 people we've worked to retain through some mechanism to make sure they were valued here and that we kept them. Now that is in addition to recruiting a number of people where we average somewhere around 10 to 15 new investigator scientists a year, the goal of getting to another 65 or 90. That process, I would say that there have been a number of factors that have been involved with that. Number one, the centralized process of recruiting is paying dividends and it's paid dividends. Tony, with her team, has done a remarkable job 
and with the Chalker Group, which has been, in some ways, a national model for us to sell Birmingham, dispel myths, and create a venue where people can understand that this is a great place to be. We've got 22 people listed here. 17 out of that 22 are not from Alabama, right? So the idea that you can't recruit here is probably not true. Uh, and so both we want to retain and we want to recruit, and we want to make this a destination, not a pass-through for people's careers. So I'm thankful for all who've invested in making that happen. So along with all that other research growth, we've also had the human talent pool grow from 259 to 323. It's a 25% growth in PIs. We've been flat for almost six years in the number of investigators, and this change has been remarkable. Finally, we've also realized that the workplace is not always as easy as we'd like. David has preached this message. Uh, one of our board members through their entity has given us resources to actually help drive a program, and investing in wellness is something that we want to make sure that we deal with burnout in our world and actually care about our physicians, our faculty, our scientists across the board, that this is a place, as well as our staff. And hopefully you'll see this roll out in a manner that allows to touch everybody at UAB as a place where they'd want to work. So everybody. Um, this well-being index is a great tool, and our hope is to roll it out to even broader number of participants. Finally, as we do this, we all know we need space, and I'm being conservative. This building is going to be transformed. I, I can't tell you the number of times I've heard throughout the first three years of electricity going out, leaks on the floor, freezers closing down, because this building was in such dire need for a remodel. And that's finally taking place, and our goal is to transform the entire building. The outer shell will look different, and we have plans, hopefully, for another space, another building to also undergo a major renovation. But this will be a core, along with the other buildings that Tika is overseeing, for driving the change in our space activities and upgrading those spaces as well. Finally, the, the big change here is really Tony Jones. Tony's role as a full-time member of our leadership team is one of the fundamental cultural changes for UAB. Both felt locally, understood nationally. Him integrated into driving what the school does and the health system does, all tied to the practice plan as well is a fundamental game changer for our institution around multiple aspects of our clinical enterprise. Um, that, I think, is one something that can't be understated, and having the right person in that role is very, really important. So what are our challenges coming up? You've heard Ray and myself and others talk about this growth in dollars and money. Arguably, you can do the math. With $100 million in net growth, we need to find 53 <coughs> cents for every dollar. So there's a need for $50 million nude money to be on the table to sustain what we already have. Yet, I know that many of you have asked the question, what about the investment in me? My pay, my raises, my own compensation. And I would say that that is certainly front and center for all of us as leaders. We realize what we do doesn't matter if we don't value our people. And yet, we're also in this concept that as we grow, it costs us. And yet, to, who, to be who we want to be, it's really driven by who you are and how you think about yourselves here. So for us, although not addressed completely, it's something that is on the forefront for our thinking of how do we create a mechanism to make sure our staff and our faculty are paid appropriately, receive the appropriate increases as needed in order to make this a place that they want to be. The AEF does need to get to 55 million. That's important to get to that threshold. And that's not easy. We have an insatiable mix of desires related to what our hospital needs for capital expenditures. We have new need of a rehab hospital. We need a home for our cancer. We don't have a direct interest for our cancer enterprise. And there's a need for new buildings on our research side. We have to constantly retain and recruit our faculty, but as much as anything, retain our best faculty as well. We need to develop a broader health system nationwide. Our footprint right now to be who we have is still a little small. We need a broader scale of footprint clinically. We're challenged in the fact that for the work we do, we earn less money than most people in the country. I visited UPenn not too long ago, and their hospital is smaller than ours, and their bottom line is two to three-fold more than ours just because of their case mix, their payer mix, and how they're able to manage it. Manage it. So even with these challenges, we have to make the lift in spite of these difficult things we face in our clinical enterprise. 
We've just had our retreat for some leaders to look at our core needs. Fundamentally, you guys have worked hard to drive the science. We have to make doing science here easier, and we have to provide environments to enhance what you do. So Chris and I are going to be working diligently this year to make sure, and as well as uh, Melinda and our team in the school, going to be working diligently this year to make sure we transform the world of research administration to serve you at the highest level. There will also be a level of accountability for your part as well as a part of making this happen. We clearly understand we have some core needs. We need to make sure our imaging is state of the art. We need to make sure single cell analysis and that informatic interpretation is available. We got to have funding to make sure people can access it. Cryo EM needs to continually be a process, a part of who we are for drug discovery. We've talked about the need for bioinformatics as well as a critical part. And you see here we need to expand some of the areas that relate to, bio, to, to the microbiome and bioinformatics. These are our space needs. If we're going to add and keep our best faculty and be able to add, these are sort of a list of what areas we need to grow in and make advantage of to grow this and add these faculty numbers to get us to that sort of mid area of the top 20. And the opportunities to do that, however, are pretty unique. And so with those challenges going forward, I'll end on these opportunities. You've heard me talk briefly about wellness. I think there is a great opportunity to make sure we manage stress in our place and provide a place where people are happy to come to work. Uh, David is doing a great job in leading that. Uh, Tony has put this on his agenda and have already made changes, hearing anecdotes, but we will need to actually have credible data that we are helping changing the environment in the workplace for our faculty to work. This idea of working in our research administration hopefully will also add value to the stress that the world we live in is not just at UAB, but it's one that we can improve here. The Alabama Genome Health Initiative is still one of the most unique entries of healthcare delivery in the country. Probably the only statewide initiative to start looking at sequencing and building the platform for informatics for our rural counties as well as our urban areas. 65 of the 67 counties have had that process begun with them getting sequences. Up to 3% of the population will find germline defects that they never knew they had to impact them and their families going forward. Bruce Korf, Matt Might, and Rick Myers at Hudson Alpha have been credible leaders as well as with their team. Mona Fuad's group, particularly on recruitment for diversity in this platform, has been a model for the NIH. And the All of Us grant is, allows us to be the institution for the entire Deep South for recruiting part of that number of a million people for whole genome sequencing for our country. Making sure these programs go forward and achieve their highest goal is a top priority for us. In addition, the 21st Century Cures Act, and probably the person who's front and center of this is, is David Standard and Craig Powell in the neuroscientist place. David's done a phenomenal job in growing the Department of Neurology as well as increasing the clinical footprint. Craig started off with the bang as he's excited about being a chair in neurobiology. The dollars around Alzheimer's disease, memory disorder, dementia are phenomenal. They're at the level of what we invested in when HIV was an incurable entity. And our challenge now with nearly 10,000 people a day turning 65 for the next 19 years and nearly a third of them having some cognitive or memory loss, this is going to be a major health problem. The one part of the curve that grows in our system as far as demographics for increasing patients is patients over 65. So our ability to make advantage, take advantage of these dollars and make an impact in the brain initiative are going to be huge. You've heard us talk about work that Matt Might is doing with Bruce Corf. There's tons of dollars related to precision medicine, and the cancer space will only grow as well. Some of that is evident already. You heard me talk about David in the work that the department is doing across the whole aspect of neuroscientists with Craig, and then Ron Lazar, who was recruited also to be a part of the team. StrokeNet having won a comprehensive stroke center, being a part of the NIH's health stroke net is really a huge step. One of David's dream was getting a Udall Center. The team of our scientists here, which Dr. Benjamin, this is a part as well, puts us in a pretty elite group. Those centers that have the Udall Center are Hopkins, Northwestern, Michigan. Now you add UAB and Stanford to that picture. And then our undiagnosed disease network, which is in partnership with Harvard that Matt Might leads. Those activities are really exciting about what we will be able to do in the future. I'll end on these things. I will say that when I've talked to other deans and other institutions, they can speak very fluently about what they do. 
and they can speak quite cogently about their outcomes. But I argue that nobody in the world has a more compelling why than UAB. We are the institution for this country to impact health disparities, health outcomes, deliver clinical care, drive science and discovery for the Deep South. I argue that transformation of this, of this area of the country rests on our shoulders. So our why is more compelling than any place else in the world. Whether you are a person working as a staff member in the hospital, in a department, or in the school, what you do at the end of the day impacts this area. You can see there's really nothing that we can be proud of in relationship to our health outcomes, and yet the impact we can have is something we can be proud of by being the place that this country depends on to make this transformation. This final quote is one that Atul Gawande, who is a surgeon who now leads this joint healthcare initiative, I think it applies to all of us. It misses only one point. It says, better is possible. It does not take genius. It takes diligence. It takes moral clarity. It takes ingenuity. What it misses is, and above all, if each of you takes the willingness to try, that's what will make a difference. It's not just a general term, but if every individual in their own space commits to actually be better, and better is possible, we can continually transform UAB, Alabama, the Deep South, and America in the next five years. Thank you very much. I'll take any questions if you have any. It was one of those things probably where it didn't lend itself to a lot, but I'm certainly open to do so. So um, I don't know the exact number. So the question is a very good question. He said, you made it clear of the billion dollars raised, largely much of that is non-discretionary but committed dollars. And he asked the relevant question, how much of that committed dollars are actually aligned with our strategic mission? And, and I'll be honest with you, Steve, I don't know the exact number. I would say that our routine is to raise around those areas, but it's also driven, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but it's driven by the donor's interest. So there is a significant amount that maps to all of those areas, and I can tell you about a gift in almost all of those spaces, but probably the biggest driver of this is the donor's interest, which can come about from any number of things of how they get interested about something. But as we initiate them, they are initiated by our own drive to make sure they're aligned with those areas. Other questions? So again, it was not hyperbole. The growth that occurred last year is remarkable and it wouldn't have occurred without alignment for your efforts and your hard work as well as leadership. So I do want to thank you. Give yourself a really hand of applause for all that was done. And if there is any extra Chick-fil-A, it's all on me. <laughs> <laughs>